in the vast rugged expanse of russia a revolution has been silently taking flight high above the majestic landscapes in the form of helicopters that have evolved to reach unparalleled heights of effectiveness and innovation from the earliest daring attempts at vertical flight to the sophisticated aerial marvels of today the journey of russian helicopters has been nothing short of extraordinary throughout the decades russian engineers constantly pushed the boundaries experimenting with novel rotor configurations streamlined airframes and cutting-edge materials as a result their helicopters became the embodiment of power versatility and ruggedness a reflection of the unforgiving terrains they were designed to conquer before we get started consider dropping a like and subscribing if you find this topic interesting as i cover a range of ideas and vehicles that you may find educational or borderline entertaining nevertheless let's get right into today's topic of the art and evolution of the russian gunship like the determined pioneers who ventured into the uncharted skies the history of russian helicopter development was marked by audacious visionaries and brilliant engineers who dared to challenge the limits of traditional aviation through countless trials and tribulations they persevered driven by an unwavering commitment to create the ultimate aerial machines. The evolution of Russian helicopters can be traced back to the groundbreaking work of Igor Sikorsky. In the halls of aviation history, few names shine as brightly as Sikorsky, the visionary engineer who is often credited with pioneering the concept of the helicopter. Born in Kiev, Russia, now Ukraine, in 1889, Sikorsky's fascination with flight began at a young age and would eventually lead him to become one of the most influential figures in the development of vertical flight. In 1908, at the tender age of 19, Sikorsky designed and built his first fixed-wing aircraft, the S-1. This early achievement marked the beginning of his illustrious career in aviation. As the years passed, Sikorsky's innovative spirit and passion for flight only intensified, propelling him to explore the possibilities of a flying machine that could hover and maneuver vertically, a helicopter. By 1909, Sikorsky had moved to Paris to further his studies in aeronautical engineering. While there, he delved into the works of pioneering aviation inventors such as Paul Cornu and Louis Bruget, who had already experimented with early helicopter prototypes. This exposure to the concept of vertical flight ignited Sikorsky's ambition to develop his own helicopter design. In 1910, he returned to Russia and established the Sikorsky Aero Engineering Research Institute in St. Petersburg. There he began working on his first helicopter project, the Sikorsky S-2. Despite making some progress, the S-2 never achieved sustained flight, serving as a crucial learning experience for Sikorsky. It wasn't until 1939, almost three decades later, that Sikorsky finally achieved his long-sought dream of the successful helicopter flight. By this time, he had emigrated to the United States, escaping the turmoil of the Russian Revolution and its aftermath. In the United States, he founded the Sikorsky Aircraft Corporation, which would become a leading helicopter manufacturer. Back over in the Soviet Union, Mikhail Mill began work on rotary-winged aircraft before Sikorsky in 1930, but the M1, his first production helicopter, began development in 1946. In 1947, Mill became head of the OKB-4 Design Bureau in Tushino, and works were intensified. A final design was named GM-1 for Gylocopter Mila, or Mill's helicopter. Soviet engineers tried to create a completely original design, so they made a rotor hub with spaced vertical and horizontal hinges. This design increased the efficiency of helicopter control and was much simpler than that used on American helicopters. The prototype completed its first free flight on the 20th of September, 1948, and in 1949 it underwent official state trials. Despite crashes of two prototypes, the design was an overall success, and after further work, was ordered for production under a new designation, MI-1. This designation was subject to further improvements during production mostly increasing reliability, especially as rotor technology was changing. The MI-1 was designed to encompass two different requirements that the Soviet Union was looking for, 
the first being a rapid takeoff and landing platform to deliver troops quickly in the heat of battle, and the second requirement being an armed weapons platform to serve as another form of support for troops on the ground. These requirements would not be changed for almost any of the helicopters produced by Russia, even in modern times. Though, initially, the Mi-1 was only designed as a troop transport, the later variations of the aircraft were modified to carry such weapons as heavy cannons, which would have made it the first gunship the Soviets ever built. In the end, production stopped before these, quote, tank buster variants could be developed further, owing to the implementation of all new designs being developed from the start to accommodate this role. The next model, the Mi-2, would be built upon the same base engine design as the Mi-1, but had much more space for carrying troops, allowing for an entire squad of infantry to be carried at once. While still not carrying weapons, the Mi-2 did convince the rest of the world that the twin turbine engine layout was by far the most efficient power plant for helicopters at the time, producing roughly 40% more thrust than the previous conventional engine used on the Mi-1. As a byproduct of the new engine design, the double intake above the cockpit would become a staple of early helicopters, and would become an iconic feature of Soviet helicopters moving forward. The next model of the helicopter was the Mi-4, skipping over the Mi-3, which was basically a heavier version of the Mi-2. The Mi-4 was yet again more of a leap rather than a jump in progress. The Mi-4 transport helicopter laid the groundwork for Soviet Army aviation. This was the first of the Soviet-designed helicopters that featured multiple weapon loadouts and would be used in an assault and support role. These loadouts could consist of four Falanga anti-tank guided missiles, 96 S-5M rockets in six blocks, six 100kg bombs, or four 250kg bombs. It was widely used both in the armed forces and in Soviet civil aviation, and for several decades remained the main type of helicopter in the inventory of the Soviet armed forces and of the civil air fleet. The Mi-4 went out of service with the development of the Mi-8. The Soviet military originally argued against a new helicopter, as they were content with the current Mi-4. To counter this, Mikhail Mill proposed that the new helicopter was more of an update to the new turbine engines rather than an entirely new helicopter, which persuaded the Council of Ministers to proceed with production. Although this helicopter was equipped with rockets and guided missiles, it still lacked the gun that would make it a gun ship. That is coming soon, don't worry. The Mi-8 is one of the most produced helicopters in the world, and is used by over 50 countries in both military and civilian uses. Strangely, the Soviet military originally showed little interest in the Mi-8 until the Bell UH-1's involvement in the Vietnam War became widely publicized as a great asset to the United States, allowing troops to move swiftly in and out of a battlefield and throughout the country. It was only then that the Soviet military rushed a troop-carrying variant of the Mil Mi-8 into production. After the Mi-8, the next few projects to get the Mi name were designed for more specialized tasks like heavy lift or anti-submarine warfare. I'll run through them real quick. There is an Mi-10, which is basically an aerial crane, then there is the huge Mi-12 prototype heavy lift helicopter, Next comes the Mi-14, which is the ASW vehicle equipped with radar and torpedoes. We skip 16 and come to the only odd-numbered aircraft of the bunch, this being the Mi-17, which is an upgraded version of the Mi-8 with more modern equipment and some build quality improvements, also being installed with the engine of the Mi-14, which quite notably increased performance numbers. I know that was a lot of information all at once, but now we finally get to the arguably most well-known of Mikhail Mill's designs, the infamous Mi-24 hind gunship. Wait, wait, I don't mean that Mi-24, I mean the Mi-24A, the original design that focused on the weaponry aspect of the military's requirements. During the early 1960s, it became apparent to Mill that the trend towards ever-increasing battlefield mobility would result in the creation of flying infantry fighting vehicles, which could be used to perform both fire support and infantry transport missions. The first expression of this concept was a mock-up unveiled in 1966 in the experimental shop of the Ministry of Aircraft's factory number 329, where Mill was head designer. The mock-up, designated V-24, was based on another project, the V-22 utility helicopter, which never flew. 
The V-24 had a central infantry compartment that could hold eight troops sitting back to back, and a set of small wings positioned to the top rear of the passenger cabin, capable of holding up to six missiles or rockets, and a twin-barreled GSH-23L cannon fixed to the landing skid. Mill proposed the design to the heads of the Soviet armed forces. While he had the support of a number of strategists, once again he was opposed by several more senior members of the armed forces, who believed that conventional weapons were a better use of resources. Despite the opposition, Mill managed to persuade the defense minister's first deputy, Marshal Andrei A. Gretschko, to convene an expert panel to look into the matter. While the panel's opinions were mixed, supporters of the project eventually held sway and a request for design proposals for a battlefield support helicopter was issued. The development and use of gunships and attack helicopters by the U.S. Army during the Vietnam War convinced the Soviets that the advantages of armed helicopter ground support and fostered support for the development of the Mi-24. In April 1979, Mi-24s were supplied to the Afghan government to deal with Mujahideen guerrillas. The Afghan pilots were well trained and made effective use of their machines but the Mujahideen were not easy targets. The first Mi-24 to be lost in action was shot down by guerrillas on the 18th of July, 1979. Despite facing strong resistance from Afghan rebels, the Mi-24 proved to be very destructive. The rebels called the Mi-24 Shaitan Arba, or Satan's Chariot. In one case, an Mi-24 pilot who was out of ammunition managed to rescue a company of infantry by maneuvering aggressively towards Mujahideen guerrillas and scaring them off. The Mi-24 was popular with ground forces since it could stay on the battlefield and provide fire as needed, while fast mover strike jets could only stay for a short time before heading back to base to refuel. The Mi-24's favored ammunition was the 80mm S-8 rocket, the 57mm S-5 having proven too light to be effective. The 23mm gun pod was also very popular. Extra rounds of rocket ammunition were often carried internally so that the crew could land and self-reload in the field. The Mi-24 could carry 10 100kg bombs for attacks on camps or strong points, while the harder targets could be dealt with a load of 4 250kg or 2 500kg bombs. Some Mi-24 crews became experts at dropping bombs precisely on their targets. The 9K114 Sturm was used infrequently largely due to a lack of targets early in the war that required the precision and range the missile offered, and a need to keep the stocks of anti-tank missiles in Europe. After the Mujahideen got access to more advanced anti-aircraft weapons later in the war, the Sturm was used more often by Mi-24 units. Combat experience quickly demonstrated the disadvantages of having an Mi-24 carrying troops. Gunship crews found the soldiers a concern and a distraction while being shot at and preferred to fly lightly loaded anyway, especially given their operations from high ground altitudes in Afghanistan. Mi-24 troop compartment armor was often removed to reduce weight, and troops would be carried in Mi-8 helicopters while the Mi-24s provided fire support. Although considered successful, the Mi-24 was still far from perfect. This led to numerous variants of the aircraft being developed. All the variants from Mi-24A through D have the so-called greenhouse cockpit before switching over to the iconic dual canopies, the forward one being for the gunner and the rear one being for the pilot. Besides minor improvements to airframe designs and engine swaps between variants, the main difference was experimenting with new and improved weapons and trying to maximize effectiveness. Being known affectionately as the flying tank by her crew, the Mi-24 is sadly the end of the Mikhail Mill line of helicopters since he passed away in 1970, right after the Mi-24 was flown for the first time. However, that does not mean it was the end for Russian gunship development as a whole. Making their debut in 1982, the dual-rotor Ka-50 and 52 entered the scene with a whole new design. While considered officially as attack helicopters, some sources do lump them in with the gunship title. A more modern take on the attack helicopter role the Ka-50 entered service in 1995, and like other Kamov helicopters, it features Kamov's characteristic coaxial contra-rotating rotor system, which removes the need for the entire tail rotor assembly and improves the aircraft's aerobatic qualities. The omission of the tail rotor is a qualitative advantage. 
because the torque countering tail rotor can use up to 30% of the engine's power. The KA50's entire transmission presents a comparatively small target to ground fire when next to the Mi-24. The collapse of the Soviet Union led to a severe drop in defense procurement. This resulted in only a dozen KA-50s delivered, instead of the planned several hundred to replace the mill Mi-24. The single-seat configuration was considered undesirable by NATO, and the first two KA-50 prototypes had false windows painted on them, which successfully misled the first Western reports of the aircraft in the mid-1980s, to the point that some analysts even concluding that its primary mission was as an air superiority aircraft for hunting and killing NATO attack helicopters. The KA-50 and its modifications have been chosen as the Special Forces support helicopter, while the MIL Mi-28 has become the main Army's gunship. The production of the KA-50 was recommended in 2006, and in 2009 the Russian Air Force received three units built from incomplete airframes dating from the mid-1990s. A cool little side note is that for improved pilot survivability, the KA-50 is fitted with the NPP Zvezda ejection seat which is a rare feature for a helicopter. Before the rocket in the ejection seat deploys, the rotor blades are blown away by explosive charges in the rotor disc and the canopy is jettisoned. To sum everything up, the study of Russian gunship designs and their evolution presents a fascinating journey through the nation's military aviation history. Over the decades, Russia has demonstrated a remarkable ability to adapt and innovate its gunship technology, catering to ever-changing operational requirements and combat environments. Through a little research, I have traced the evolution of Russian gunship designs from their inception during the early days of rotary-winged aircraft to the cutting-edge gunships of today. We observed a persistent commitment to enhancing firepower, survivability, and versatility, with each generation of gunships building upon the strengths and lessons of its predecessors. The emergence of the iconic Mi-24, with its unique combination of troop transport and heavy armament capabilities, stands as a testament to Russia's pioneering spirit in rotary wing aircraft development. Subsequent iterations like the Mi-28 and Ka-52 have further refined the gunship concept, incorporating state-of-the-art avionics, advanced weapon systems, and stealth technologies. Moreover, I hope that I have shed light on the crucial role played by real-world combat experiences in shaping the evolution of Russian gunship designs. Armed conflicts such as the Soviet-Afghan War and Chechen campaigns exposed the strengths and vulnerabilities of these gunships, leading to critical improvements and adaptations to address specific challenges encountered in the battlefield. It is evident that Russian gunship designs have also influenced other nations in their own quest for formidable aerial firepower. The widespread use of Russian gunships in various conflicts around the world has solidified their reputation as a reliable and deadly combat assets. However, the need to balance weight, range, and firepower remains an ongoing concern as the demands of modern warfare continuously evolve. Additionally, advancements in anti-aircraft weaponry and electronic warfare systems require constant innovation to maintain the gunship's edge on the battlefield. As we look to the future, the evolution of Russian gunships will undoubtedly continue, with new challenges presenting opportunities for further refinement and advancement in this essential aspect of aerial warfare. Thank you for watching this video, and if you have any questions or concerns, please feel free to leave a comment down below. While you're down there, consider leaving a like or even subscribing as it really helps the almighty YouTube algorithm show my content to others. Speaking of content, you can find more of mine above if you would like to check it out. If not, then once again, I hope you enjoyed and stay tuned for the next video.